<laughs> Whoops. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so that's your implicit and explicit attitudes. It's, it's possible to have two different ideas. So, uh, and this may be one of the reasons why policemen uh, are shooting black men in the streets. Uh, it hasn't been happening lately, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, mainly because there has been such a huge backlash. If you remember Ferguson. Uh, Ferguson is right outside of St. Louis. St. Louis has a history of some really uh, violent uh, inter, uh, racial problems, uh, St. Louis does. You wouldn't think it would because St. Louis was the gateway to the north. Uh, so it should be a, a northern city, but it has southern uh, attitudes as well. Um, if you were black uh, in 1950, you couldn't, live, uh, you couldn't live in St. Louis itself. You had to live in East St. Louis. That's where you lived. <clears throat> Uh, one of the most famous people from St. Louis is uh, Chuck Berry, uh, the, the rock star, the rocker. He's, he died last year uh, at an advanced age, which is really kind of interesting. But uh, uh, he's from East St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> it was a dangerous place to go, East St. Louis, if you were white, strangely enough. Um, but it was a dangerous place to go uh, in St. Louis if you're black. So there was a lot of racial tension going on, and of course Ferguson is right there. Uh, Ferguson is kind of in between the, the two cities. So the racial tension exploded in Ferguson. Uh, as it turns out, what do we know about Ferguson? Well, Ferguson had a, uh, an almost entirely white uh, police force. Yet it was 70% uh, black. And there, were a lot of, there was a lot of racial tension uh, going on inside the police force. Um, what do we know about uh, some of the emails they sent? They sent some really derogatory emails about uh, uh, Barack Obama, who was president of the United States at the time, of course. Uh, one of them had to do with uh, showing a picture of uh, President Obama as a monkey. So that's kind of insulting. <coughs> that's not kind of insulting. That's very insulting. And and this was a this was a joke that was that was circulating around the police department. Well, they had a really negative uh, attitude toward African Americans. And then, of course, uh, the individual was shot. That's kind of interesting. Huh, OK. Uh, anyway, the, the individual was shot. And then they had all the, uh, the uh, problems in Ferguson. Uh, and of course, there were individuals who were going, well, they shouldn't be rioting in the street. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, he really did something wrong. Uh, well, maybe he did do something wrong, and maybe he deserved to be shot. <laughs> Somebody wanna... Like, Hello? Okay, thank you. Back. <laughs> they came home. We're, we're good. All my dogs have come home. Oh, yeah, all, all, the, all the dogs that are supposed to be in the house are in the house, and all the dogs that are supposed to be outside the house are gone. Okay, so how do we measure uh, implicit attitudes? Uh, the people at Harvard have come up with a test called the Implicit Association Test. Really kind of a fascinating test. Uh, I would suggest that you try it, uh, that you take it. Uh, you can take it uh, looking at any, any different group. Uh, I took it, uh, I, I've taken the test uh, uh, looking at my implicit attitude toward African Americans. I took it uh, looking at my implicit attitude toward American Indians, which is kind of confusing because there's 567 different tribes. <laughs> so who was, who, who was I thinking of when I, when I took the test? Anyway, you can take the implicit a association test. Really fascinating test. Uh, the IAT uh, pairs categories of items with positive and negative stimuli. For example, you press a key if the stimulus is good or refers to women. Uh, you press a, key, a different key if the stimulus is bad or, or refers to men, and then they will reverse it. Uh, and it has to do with the speed that you react. Uh, usually when, it's, when something is good, you react faster than when something is bad. Uh, and that's exactly what they see. So what, what they're doing, actually doing is measuring uh, the amount of time it takes you to react to something good or bad. Uh, so they will, ha they will say, uh, uh, all, uh, <laughs> you know, they'll show a picture of, of the mountains 
and of course that's good, right? So they'll show a picture of the mountain, you're supposed to say it's good. Uh, then the next time they'll say, uh, then they'll show a picture of a woman, and uh, in, initially you say that, that it's good, uh, then later you're supposed to say that women are bad, and it, it all depends on how fast you react. You know, how, how fast you can get that uh, taken care of in your own brain, I guess. Really kind of bizarre. Anyway, I would suggest taking it. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, social psychology at Harvard University and you can take actually take this test. Uh, a lot of different things. There's probably one about uh, Donald Trump, which should be very interesting. The IAT, the uh, Implicit Association Test, assesses uh, reaction time, as I said before. Anyway, so it uh, assesses reaction time. Um, <laughs> we all have reference groups. Uh, reference groups have, have to do with the individuals uh, that we see as iconic. And this will be our reference group. Uh, the group, uh, we orient ourselves to these individuals. Uh, maybe you're a baseball fan, so uh, your reference group would be the New York Yankees or the Cincinnati Red Legs or whatever. Or maybe you're a football fan or a hockey fan. And so your reference group would be the Philadelphia Flyers or something. Uh, it's the group with which you have, uh, that you emotionally identify. Uh, I am a baseball fan and I like the San Francisco Giants. Uh, so I emotionally identify with that group, as interesting as that is. Uh, I'm relatively liberal, so I, I emotionally identify with the Democratic Party, pretty much. Uh, okay, and they're also the group that, uh, whose standards we use to judge ourselves and others. Uh, so when I think about uh, my politics, uh, I will look at the two different parties, or whatever we're looking at at the time, and uh, I will try to gauge whether my feelings or my ideas are, are proper and correct. Uh, reference groups. So once upon a time, and we didn't even understand what reference groups were for the longest period of time. Um, what happened? Uh, <laughs> the, the, during the Depression, uh, there were individuals that, uh, one of the problems they had during the Depression was they kept making these movies about wealthy people. Uh, and there were, uh, and all of a sudden people stopped going to movies and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then they realized that, uh, that people couldn't, they couldn't use the wealthy people as their reference group. They couldn't identify with, the, with that reference group. So they started making movies about poor people or about people that didn't have a lot of money uh, because most people that go to the movies are not wealthy. Therefore, that they wouldn't use the wealthy as their reference group. And they started using wealthy people as their foils. In other words, they started showing uh, wealthy people as, very, as relatively negative. Uh, and when they did that, people started going to the movies, watching the movies. <clears throat> One of the... the uh, uh, of course, the Depression started in 1929. It, it uh, hit its uh, uh, the worst point about 1932. In 1932, the most popular movie was uh, It Happened One Night. It was about a rich, spoiled woman who decides she's going to run away uh, and go back to her the husband that, she, that her father doesn't want her to marry. Uh, but she's so spoiled and stupid that she can't, she can't do it on her own. So she, uh, this uh, reporter decides he's going to help her. Of course, the reporter's poor, he doesn't have a job, you know, it's one of those kind of deals. Uh, so he helps her get from Florida, from, uh, from Miami Beach to uh, New York. Uh, so he helps her uh, on, on, the, on the trip. And of course, during the trip, they fall in love. Of course they do. <laughs> Anyway, so people could uh, identify with Clark Gable. He was the, he was the male lead. Uh, nobody identified with Claudette Col Colbert because she was a spoiled little rich girl. Uh, eventually, of course, they fall in love and she becomes more uh, uh, common thinking. Of course, of course she does. Uh, and uh, eventually, in the end, of course, they are able to get married and everybody's happy. Okay, so this is what was going on. And this is what we're, what, when we talk about reference groups, uh, this is what we're talking about. So Hollywood figured this out a long, long before social psychologists, social psychologists did. Uh, at uh, Bennington College, Newcomb did uh, studies. He was the first one to do studies with reference groups. Uh, so he was looking at uh, people from uh, Bennington College. Bennington College is in Vermont. Uh, most of the people that go to, it's an all-women's college, 
Oddly enough, it's an all-women's college, but the faculty were all male. Most of the women that, that go there are from conservative New England families. And this is one of the things that they determined before they started the study. Most of the male uh, faculty were relatively liberal. Liberal in their 30s, you know, relatively young men uh, in their 30s and relatively liberal. Now the interesting thing was that if you were a faculty member at Bennington, you couldn't be married. Isn't that strange? You would think that they would want them to be married, but they weren't. That was, that was the rules. So they did the, the study between 1935 and 1939. They looked at the freshman class, and when the women came in, they were from relatively affluent, conservative uh, New England families. Uh, the faculty, of course, were all male. They were fairly liberal. And most of them were in their 30s. So the male faculty became the reference group for the girls. So what do you think happened during their four years in college? Did they stay conservative? Did they, did they become liberal, like their faculty? What happened? What would you think happened? You've watched the movies. You know what happens. <laughs> you haven't seen that movie, so maybe you don't know what happened. So what happened? Any guesses? Did the women say conservative or did they become liberal? I guess that's the point. They became liberal. <clears throat> uh, yeah, to, most, to the most extent that's exactly what happened. He discovered that with education, most of the conservative adolescents became liberal young adults by graduation. It only took four years. Not all the students became liberal, but the ones that, that changed were more likely to, uh, to seek independence from their families. Before they were uh, wards of the family and they stayed with the family and they sucked money off of the family. Uh, they, the, uh, the ones that became liberal were more likely to become independent. Uh, they were tended to be more socially secure. Uh, so they didn't, uh, they didn't look to the family for their social support. Uh, they were able to function in, in, in any society uh, because they were more liberal. Uh, they had higher self-esteem. Uh, they were less socially isolated uh, than the women who, uh, uh, who were conservative. Uh, the liberal attitudes became very stable. Follow-up studies in 1939 of the 1939 graduates in the 1960s and 1990s found that the women maintained their liberal orientation uh, about 0.47, which is pretty high. It's is not bad. And that's Martha Graham. She's a famous uh, choreographer from uh, Broadway who would teach at Bennington during the summer or during the uh, winter, and then she'd go to Broadway in the summer and do choreography, and she was extremely famous and, as you can see, fairly flexible. Uh, anyway, and even to this day, the, uh, the dance uh, uh, program at uh, Bennington College is one of the premier dance programs in the United States. Not that that's important, uh, but we're talking about attitudes, right? We're talking about attitudes. Exactly. Uh, seeing an unfamiliar stimulus many times can lead to, to uh, uh, the liking of that thing. Uh, mere exposure effect. This is known as a mere exposure effect. Uh, unless the individual has initial negative reactions to it, uh, they will uh, accept it. Uh, so if you hear a song you don't, and, uh, and you're kind of neutral about the song, the more you hear that song, the more likely that you are to like that song. And if it comes on the radio, you're more likely to listen to it because you have been exposed to it, and now you, now you know that song. Once upon a time in the United States, I know this sounds horrible, I, I apologize for this, I don't want to scare anybody, but once upon a time in the United States, there weren't any tape players. You had records, but you didn't have tape players. So if you wanted to listen to a song, you either had to go home and play it on the phonograph over and over and over again, but if you wanted to listen to it in your car, you had to hope that it came on the radio, the song, okay? So we had to listen to all this music just to hear the, the good songs, right? So you listen to a lot of crap. <laughs> this is in the 60s and 70s, of course. And then they invented 8-tracks. Uh, <laughs> we put 8-tracks in our cars. Of course, 8-track is about the size of this thing right here. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, exactly. This, that's, that's the size of an 8-track tape. <laughs> and it's a whole album, of course. 
Um, and it was, you played uh, one side and then you played the other side. That's the way it looked at it. So it flipped the, the, the tape over and played the other side. And of course it would stretch out and get, uh, start screaming at you. It was really kind of horrible. Anyway, so once upon a time we had to listen to all the music just to hear the good songs. Uh, but they used to play the top ten songs over and over and over again. So if it was in the top ten, then you would hear it maybe once an hour or, or whatever. And so you'd be driving down the road, you'd turn on the radio, and they'd be on number five, and you're going, oh man, I can't wait till it flips over and they start and they play number three again. I can't wait. Just the way it worked. Anyway, okay, so if you have a negative reaction to that song and of course, a lot of the songs I was listening to in the 60s, a lot of them were pretty crappy songs. But I listened to them, and the reason we listened to them is because we didn't have a choice. It's the only music we could hear, <clears throat> unless you went home, bought the album, and of course, the albums are relatively expensive, too. Or you could buy the single, the 45, and listen to it. Uh, the, uh, Robert Zients, uh, in uh, 1968, uh, identified the mere exposure effect uh, the liking requires no knowledge of the subject. Uh, it is automatic because you've heard it before, you've seen it before. Uh, maybe you like a select actor. Uh, the first time you saw that actor, you didn't even recognize them. You didn't know, of course, you didn't know who they were. Uh, but then you saw them in another show, and then you saw them in another show. And that's one of the reasons why uh, in Hollywood, if you've got somebody on a, a sitcom or somebody on a, a television show, uh, because people watch them every week and they may not like their character, uh, but if they, they put them in a movie, everybody goes, I know that guy. I know that lady. That's, that's, that's the, the lady from, you know, NCIS New Orleans or something. You go, oh, I know that lady. So all of a sudden, uh, you, you like that person because you recognize that person. This is known as a mere exposure effect. You ever really put in your mind that you really like that person, but because you see them over and over and over again. And this is what happened with Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, what's that kid's name? Chris somebody. Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. Is that his name? Chris Pratt? Yeah. Yeah. So he was on a television show. And then all of a sudden, and he, he kept losing weight and gaining weight and losing weight and gaining weight. Then he was in Guardians of the Galaxy. Now he's a big Hollywood star. He's, he's one of the premier stars in Hollywood. But he started out on television in some odd show where he was a fat guy. Right? <laughs> Wasn't it? He was a little bit I, see, you don't even remember. But we when we saw him in Guardians of the Galaxy, we recognized him and then he started dancing to Redbone. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And all of a sudden everybody loves the guy. Uh, okay, so this is you don't even have to think about it. It's just a natural thing. Attitudes formed uh, through mere exposure are often implicit. It's it's not your fault that you're like Chris Pratt. Um, and now and then he was in a movie with uh, Jennifer Lawrence, something about going into outer space, and he was a mechanic, and he fell in love with her, and so he woke her up, and then they fell in love. She got mad. The Can passengers? The passengers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hated Bradley Cooper, but then I started to like him. You didn't like him before? I didn't like him before. I thought okay. he was an asshole. But now you like him because his characters are yeah. nicer. Yeah. He's more charming. Yes, he's a, he's a charming fellow. Of course, we don't know what he's like in real life. Yeah. Exactly. All we know is his, his characters. Neurologically, different brain areas account for different kinds of mere exposure effects. A possible explanation for the phenomenon is familiar objects are unlikely to be dangerous. So if we know this, this guy, this character, uh, then we know that they're not, uh, that uh, we, we have identified them as non-dangerous before. Uh, so the first time I met Francis, I'm going, oh my God, he scared me. <laughs> but then the more I uh, was exposed to uh, being around Francis, the, the less dangerous he seemed. And of course now, if I saw, well, I saw him walking up the, the uh, uh, walking into the building, and you didn't scare me at all. So there you go. <laughs> I knew, I know that he's not dangerous, so that's okay. Attitudes can form through classical conditioning. A neutral stimulus uh, paired with an object that uh, naturally evokes an attitude response can cause the neutral object to come to uh, evoke the same attitude response. So if we pair two things together, uh, what happened? Uh, uh, there was a, an actor that my, my wife saw in a, in a horror movie, 
and she, it's, he scared her. And so every time he was in a movie after that, she couldn't stand it, no matter what his character was, because he scared her the first time that she saw him. So she identified him with that first character that she saw. Because he was paired with a negative uh, attitude, but uh, a negative character, uh, she couldn't see him as any other character. So he was paired with a, a, a negative stimulus. And because of that, uh, she didn't like him anymore. Uh, he was in Goodbye Columbus, uh, and which his character was kind of a nerdy guy, and, and he was kind of, kind of a cute guy, but she hated the movie. She hated the movie completely because, uh, because he played somebody that didn't fit the character. That's what she said. Goodbye, Columbus. Really interesting movie. Early research on prejudice showed that emotional components of prejudice could be classically conditioned. Classical conditioning of attitudes can occur below the level of conscious awareness, a process known as subliminal conditioning. And, and of course, there's a lot of subliminal conditioning taking place in commercials. Uh, so they will try to attach uh, an idea to a soap or a shampoo or, or whatever. Uh, once upon a time, there was a soccer player by the name of Mia Hamm, a really good soccer player, uh, not an unattractive woman. Uh, anyway, Pert decided that they were going to tie their, uh, their product to Mia Hamm. And uh, as soon as she became the spokeswoman for Pert, all of a sudden everybody's buying Pert. The guys are buying Pert, the women are buying Pert. It's a, it's a uh, shampoo with a, with a conditioner. Yes, two in one, exactly. <laughs> I mean, before that, people were buying uh, shampoo, and then they were buying conditioner, and, but then everybody started buying Pert because it was because they uh, attached uh, the uh, shampoo, which had nothing at all to do with Mia Hamm, except they gave her enough money to actually shampoo her hair, and then she would throw her hair around the bottom. <laughs> they may, they had her grow longer hair. Soccer players shouldn't have long hair, then they had to pull it back. When a, when a behavior is rewarded, it is more likely to occur in the future. Uh, perceiving a praise for holding an attitude is likely to strengthen the attitude. Attitudes can be shaped by observational learning. This is what uh, Donald Trump did during the election. Uh, he had a lot of catchphrases. Uh, one of them was, uh, who's going to build the wall? And then everybody would scream, Mexico. <clears throat> he s would say, what should we do with Hillary Clinton? And they would scream, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. Uh, he, he, was, he was attaching, <laughs> he, was atta he was attaching this, this whole phrase uh, to an attitude. And because he was able to do that, and because it was something relatively simple, he was able to get people to think that, uh, for one thing, that the wall was going to be built by Mexico. And the other thing was that, uh, that Hillary was a criminal and she needed to be locked up. Um, of course, well, if you know anything about the election, you know that, that uh, they, they exonerated her not once but twice as far as whatever he thought that she needed to be locked up for. Uh, he was saying at the debates that he was going to make sure that she was prosecuted after, after he was elected president. And he was elected president, so what happened? Is she in jail? Mm -hmm. Has she been prosecuted? Has she been charged with anything? No. She hasn't, has she? <laughs> Wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. He said he was going to do that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. So what, what, they've done, what they did, uh, they tied an attitude to an idea. They conditioned, they conditioned those people who wanted to vote against or for. So a lot of people voted against Hillary Clinton. They didn't vote for Donald Trump, they voted against somebody. And that's, of course, what he was trying to do. He was trying to get the individuals that didn't like Hillary Clinton to vote for him, of course, by voting against Hillary Clinton. It's really kind of interesting. Attitudes can be shaped by observational learning. Individuals can learn an attitude by watching the way others are rewarded or punished as they interact with an attitude object. And if you, if you know anything about the beginnings of his rallies, uh, in the beginning, uh, there were only the people in the front would be screaming this, you know, lock her up and uh, uh, who's going to build the wall in Mexico. But all of a sudden, I mean, it, be, it became something that everybody did when they went to the rallies. 
Uh, not only that, but they made sure that they that they kicked out anybody who they thought might not say the right thing. <laughs> they came to, uh, uh, I was teaching at Ashford at the time, of course, and uh, this is in uh, 2015. Uh, they were, I was teaching at Ashford, which is in Clinton, Iowa, and the Quad Cities are right there. And uh, he, he came to the Quad Cities a couple of times a couple times and so uh, some some of my students went down to see him uh, well a lot of my students were african-american a lot of my students were hispanic uh, none of them could get in uh, actually one of them did get in because he had a ticket and they ushered him out despite the fact he had a ticket because he was the wrong he was black they didn't want him in the uh, they didn't want him in there because they were afraid he would yell the wrong thing I know it's right he had to be white to be able to go to one of his rallies. <laughs> so my students got really upset, and they, of course, they all decided that they were going to uh, try to do something about that and get Hillary elected. And of course, it didn't work. Obviously, it didn't work. <clears throat> Attitudes are influenced by changes in facial expression, head movement, and body posture. One explanation is that the, the facial feedback hypothesis is the, just the way that you look it can change your attitude. Really? Is that possible? So if I'm smiling when I say something nasty, does that mean that I'm going to be happy about it? Or it's going to change my attitude? Yeah, that's the way it works. The facial feedback hypothesis, people infer their own emotional states from muscle position. Uh, so if you're smiling, then you're more likely to accept something. If you're, if you're frowning, you're more likely to reject something. Another explanation is a vascular theory of emotion. One facial expression causes cooling of the blood uh, to the brain, thus elevating your mood. Uh, so that is a, wait a minute, I've got, I've got an example. This is a, uh, an experiment done in uh, Germany. Uh, what they did, they had uh, the individuals hold a pin in their mouths. And some of them were told to hold the pin in their mouths with their mouth open and some of them were told to hold the pin in their mouths with their mouth closed. Uh, if you hold a pin in your mouth with your mouth closed, it, it makes you frown. If you hold a pin in your mouth with your mouth open, it makes you smile. And then they show them a funny, a funny movie, or a movie that was supposed to be funny, or whatever. Anyways, and then they had them rank the movie as to how funny it was. Well, the people with the pin in their mouth that were forced to uh, keep their mouth open and were forced to smile, thought the movie was funnier than the people who were frowning when they were watching the movie. As interesting as that is. So, just by smiling, you can make yourself happy. It will change your mood. Do you believe that? <laughs> it's true. I know, it's really kind of interesting. All right. <clears throat> That's attitude. Let's talk about persuasion. Persuasion is a process by which a message induces change in beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors. Uh, researchers from the 1980s and 1990s determined that there were two routes of persuasion, the central route and the peripheral route. The central route involves focusing on arguments. Uh, when the arguments are strong and compelling, persuasion is likely. When people hear an argument that is weak, they counter-argue and persuasion cannot take place. So the central route has to do with reasoning, thinking about what you're, you're hearing. That has to do with the central route. The peripheral route, on the other hand, uh, use, uh, well, per, the peripheral route has to do with uh, emotion, uh, creating emotion. Uh, as it turns out, most, advertis most advertisers do not use the central route. If we're talking about uh, what's the difference between a Ford and a Chevy, General Motors and Ford, I guess about it. I mean, they're both cars, right? Uh, you either like Fords or you hate Fords. You either like Chevys or you hate Chevys. You either like Japanese cars or you hate Japanese cars. They really, okay. Well, what's the difference? Which car is better? Chevy. <laughs> is there really that much of a difference between one car and the other car? One's lighter. I don't know, maybe. Ford. <laughs> Well, I don't know. You can probably find a Ford that's heavy. You can probably find a Chevy that's light, right? Uh, if we're talking about trucks, I don't know. You're either a Chevy guy or a Ford guy. Or maybe you're a Dodge guy. Those are even bigger. 
right? They don't make small dodges anymore. They used to, but they don't anymore. So which is the better car? Well, they're all primarily the same. They, they all get you down the road. They all break down about 100,000 miles. The transmission falls out, whatever. It all depends on which car you've got. <laughs> Ford does not stand for found on the road daily. That's not true, even though that's what it spells. It doesn't really make any difference. My point is it really doesn't make any difference. So how in the world is Chevy going to get you to buy a Chevy? How is a Ford going to get you to buy a Ford? How's a, how is a, a Dodge Ram going to get you to buy a Dodge Ram? Persuasion. Persuasion. But yeah, they have to persuade you. But they have to use emotion. Because they can't say Dodge is three times better than, than Ford at making engines, which isn't true at all. They're, the difference between the engines is, is this much. So they can't really argue. Uh, they can't use reason to, to uh, argue. Uh, they have to use emotion. So that's what most advertisers do. If you go to the, if you're buying a dish, dish detergent, uh, do you buy Dawn or do you buy Ajax or I don't know? I don't know. I want to, I buy Dawn, okay, <laughs> because it cuts grease. So uh, what do you buy, and, and what's the difference between one and the other? They use Dawn to clean birds when they get an, an oil spill. We haven't had an oil spill for about four or five years. We haven't had one since we had one down in the Gulf. So who cares? Do we, it, does it really make any difference? My dishes get clean whether I use Joy or whether I use... My hands look about the same as if I use Dawn or whatever, right? So how in the world are they going to persuade me to buy their stuff? Reason isn't going to work because there's, the difference isn't that great. So they have to use they have to use the, the peripheral route. Uh, peripheral route uses emotion. When people are distracted or not motivated to think, uh, easily understood familiar statements are more persuasive than novel statements with the same meaning. So if we can create something in your mind, if we can create. Uh, something that you will say over and over and over again. If we can create a jingle that plays over in your head, a, a earworm, then you're more likely to buy that uh, buy that product. Once upon a time, jingles were were, were the thing. Uh, this was back when uh, people were listening to the radio, and uh, they came up with a a, a phrase: uh, "Lucky strike means fine tobacco." LSMFT. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. And they repeated that over and over and over again. It became an earworm. So when somebody went to buy cigarettes, that would play in their head. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Uh, old gold, you know, that they don't have any, any uh, a phrase. So people wouldn't buy old gold. They, they would buy Lucky Strike. Uh, does, is Lucky Strike flavor that much better than old gold or Chesterfield or Winston or... Hell no, they all taste like cigarettes, so who cares? They all taste the same. But Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, therefore Lucky Strike must be a better tobacco. And this played over and over in people's brains, so they started buying Lucky Strike. Not only that, but uh, they were giving Lucky Strikes away. Even into the Vietnam War, they were giving Lucky Strike tobacco away. As strange as it may seem. Anyway, so ads for products often use visual uh, peripheral cues as well. Uh, not only do they uh, establish an earworm, but they also use uh, different techniques to get you to buy their product. And these techniques have to do with uh, equating their product to beauty, to youth, and to pleasure. So I've got some advertisements for you. These are old Coke commercials. So, uh, this is, you remember, you remember this one. Isn't that cute? Oh yeah, look, polar bears drinking Coca-Cola. Well, of course they drink Coca-Cola. Everybody knows polar bears drink Coke. There's so many Cokes up there. There's all these Coke distributing places in, in the Arctic. But as you can see, they were trying to tie Coca-Cola to, uh, uh, to youth and beauty and pleasure because Coca-Cola is fun. Obviously, it's fun. He's carrying two Cokes. All these people are smiling, and they're all relatively young. And everybody seems to be having a pretty damn good time. <clears throat> so Coca-Cola has to do with youth and beauty. This is the cam this is camel cigarettes. Uh, this is during these two are during the war. That's really kind of interesting. Or these three actually were during World War II. 
So they're trying to tie it to uh, fighting in the war, camel cigarettes. Uh, this guy is a surveyor. This guy's a rodeo uh, rider. He's a bronc rider. Her husband smokes camel's tobacco. And then, of course, they uh, tried to tie the uh, uh, camels to uh, young, young people. So they started using cartoons. Why in the world would you use a cartoon? I mean, is that going to get an adult to buy tobacco? No. Uh, but it certainly is going to get uh, 16, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds to buy tobacco. <clears throat> so it has to do with youth, beauty, and pleasure. This is uh, beer. <laughs> Miller Light or Miller High Life. Miller Beer. This is the oldest commercial. This one uh, has to do with bowling. Everybody drinks beer while they bowl. Everybody knows that. It's fun. They're not so young. Uh, there's only two uh, young people in this. In this, all, all of these advertisements. One is this one, and the other one is that one. <clears throat> one has to do with sex. I apologize for that, but it, I didn't make up the advertisement. What does beer have to do with a deer? Does that make you want to drink beer? A buck? Or does that have to do with pleasure? What does it have to do with? I don't understand. Yeah, shooting deer is a lot of fun. Especially, and that one looks pretty healthy, relatively healthy. Beach volleyball. Only well, young people get to play beach volleyball. Young and tan, of course. And then the one, the other one is. Cars, yeah, we'll talk about cars. But uh, the one that has to do with sex, it's this one up here. There's a shock for you. So beer would use sex to sell their beer. Does that make sense? So what does it say? It's time to satisfy your beer tooth. We have beer teeth. The operant word there is satisfy. Of course, it has to do with they're trying to talk about sex. I won't explain this to you. You can figure it out on your own. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate goal of advertisers, preachers, and even college professors is to have people pay attention to their message. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you guys to listen to what the hell I have to say. Okay. Uh, this usually involves some form of behavioral change. Uh, change is uh, most likely to occur when people think deeply about a topic. And of course, that's what I'm trying to get you to do is to think deeply, to think as deeply as, I, as you possibly can. Um, arguments are not as likely to change someone's behavior as to get individuals thinking, which in turn changes their behavior. So what I'm trying to do is get you to think. That's why I throw all this stuff at you, I throw all these pictures at you, try to get you to think, try to, to get you to put two and two together, so to make four, or to make, uh, I don't know, 5,365, I don't know. What I'm trying to do is get you to think on your own. I'm trying to get you to uh, take what we have, this is the past, this is all the past, and think about what's going to happen in the future because you guys are going to be creating the future. If we don't innovate, if we don't change, if things don't change, then there is no innovation. So it's up to you guys to make things change in psychology. This all may be a pile of crap. This may be a pile of crap that somebody from a Europe created. And they convinced people in the United States to start spewing this crap. And so we've been spewing it for such a long time that we just keep doing it. Maybe that's the way it is. It may be worse than that. This, maybe this crap comes from the East Coast. We don't live on the East Coast. Those are people from New York. They've got different ways of looking at the world. It's one of the reasons why when I pick a, a textbook, I make sure that the person is from the Midwest. That they're not from New York or they're not from California because those people have specific types of ideas. They think in mass, en masse, because if you've ever been to New York or Boston, it's crowded. And so that's the way they think. California thinks that they have all the answers. New York thinks that they have all the answers. But people in the Midwest know that they don't have all the answers, that we need to ask questions. And that's where it comes from, from asking questions. And we let you do the thinking. They tell you what to think. People on the East Coast, people on the West Coast, it's people in the middle that say, we need to think. And so that's why I try to I pick textbooks from the middle of the country. Because they're less likely to tell you that this is the answer to the question. 
they're more likely to ask the question and try to get you to answer the question. Okay. <clears throat> wow. Let me get off my soapbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> so what are we doing? We're trying to change people's behaviors. Uh, thus, the central route is the most likely to change someone's behavior, uh, reasoning, you, and, and that's what I'm trying to get you to do. A lot of times uh, in, in classes, uh, you want me to give you the answer, you want me to tell you what the answer is. That's why when I ask a question, it doesn't have an answer. It, it's an opinion. And I want you to tell me what you think. Potentially, if I can get you to think, and if I can get you to think about what the answer might potentially be, then you'll actually come up with an answer that, doesn't, that isn't in the book. And that's actually better than if you come up with the answer in the book. I've had students ask me, well, where's the answer? I can't find it. It's not in the book. No, it's not in the book. I didn't ask you that kind of a question. Who would do that? I don't, I don't want you to just spew this stuff. It's like, it's like getting stuck in the mud and then trying to rev the tires and the tires spin out all this mud. You know, all you're doing is digging the same damn hole. You don't need to be in the same damn hole. Let's get in, the, let's get in our own damn hole and <laughs> spin the tires. Let's think on our own. That's, that's the idea. <clears throat> uh, life has become so complex that many times people do not think about decisions that must be made, but believe experts are trusted friends. And of course, that's what happened during the election. Uh, there were people that were uh, repeating uh, Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly. And, I mean, they were, and they were using the same phrases. Uh, I went in for a heart cath. No, that's not right. I went in for a, a stress test. Uh, it's where they stress out your heart and then they take pictures of it to find out how much damage has been done and whether there's any blockages or whatever. Uh, anyway, so I was in there and it was a new guy. I'd never seen this guy before. And uh, so we're talking about something and, and uh, we're talking about politics and he starts talking about snowflakes. Snowflakes. Do you have any idea what snowflakes are? Snowflakes are people that are liberals that are so delicate that they can't handle the truth. But those are snowflakes. So a snowflake, a snowflake is too delicate. You can't really breathe on them or destroy them. Okay. So they can't really. And so they don't listen to Hannity and they don't listen to Bill O'Reilly. And, and he called them snowflakes. I thought snowflake was a place down by Payson, right? Yeah, exactly. That's where, that's where Marius is from. Marius Begay is from. Snowflake. Anyway, so he got started calling them snowflakes, and I had never heard the term before, and he had to explain it to me. And uh, so he says, well, if, you don't, if you've never heard of a snowflake, you must be one. And I'm thinking, I've been in combat, <laughs> you jackass. <laughs> I've been through a lot of stuff, okay? <laughs> You're calling me a snowflake? You're telling me I'm so delicate I can't handle the truth? You know, I, I, let me tell you about the truth. Yeah, it was kind of weird. It was, it was really interesting. It was an interesting conversation. So evidently I'm a snowflake. I'm so delicate. Okay, <laughs> Okay. so what are we talking about? We're talking about too much to think about. Okay, so the world is really complex right now. And so there are a lot of individuals that use, that can't think on their own. They don't want to think about politics. They don't want to think about what's going on in the world. They don't want to think about Russia, who just produced a video uh, telling us that they have a weapon that can destroy us. Isn't that exciting? And then they, they in the video, they showed all these warheads uh, uh, converging on Florida, as odd as that may seem. Why would they do that? I know. So is, how scary is that? Do we really not have a weapon that can defend us against, uh, against that weapon? Do they really have a brand new weapon that uh, MIRVs? MIRV, that's a... Uh, a, uh, it's a, it's a uh, warhead that, that expands and, it, and uh, shoots out like 25 different warheads. A MIRV, it's called MIRV. Okay. Anyway, do they really have a MIRV that can do that? The answer is no. Hell no. They haven't, they haven't been developing anything like that for an extended length of time. But they made a really good movie. How many people believe it? Well, I'm sure there are some people that believe it. Maybe Donald Trump believes it. <clears throat> I don't know. 
Now, this is a rule of thumb heuristic that many people live by, that the world is too complex. Therefore, we need other individuals to tell us what to do. For backers of George W. Bush, uh, just being told that the invasion of Iraq was necessary was enough to convince them of the necessity. Uh, cynics or Democrats were more circumspect, of course, uh, and of course, and we did invade uh, Iraq. Didn't we? Didn't we invade Iraq to get rid of the weapons of mass destruction? Does anybody remember that? That was in 2000. You were, what, five at the time we invaded Iraq? Okay. So how do we persuade people? Well, there's four components to persuasion. One is, who is the communicator? Uh, so who's going to be doing the talking? The other, uh, and uh, a second element is uh, the message. What message are they going to be conveying? Uh, the third is how the message is being communicated. How are they talking to us? Is it on television? Is it in uh, newsprint? Uh, how many people read? That's a, a question. Uh, is it in a video? So how is the, mu uh, the message being uh, communicated? And the last is who is the audience? What audience are they aiming at? We have the communicator, the message, how it's being communicated, and who is the audience. Those are the four components to persuasion. A communicator is the most effective when uh, he preaches to the choir, and this is one of the reasons why we never, we very rarely see Donald Trump uh, giving a speech to a group that uh, isn't in favor of him, because they might boo him, which has ha happened in the past. So he stopped going to the he stopped going to those rallies. He only goes to rallies uh, if we if he does a major speech. It's usually to a group of Republicans. Uh, it's usually to a conservative group. He doesn't talk to liberal groups. He doesn't talk to the NAACP. He doesn't talk to the vets anymore because the vets came out against him during the, the election and he was he was upset. So he doesn't talk to the vets anymore. He just talks to conservative groups. He wants to make a speech. He makes a speech in uh, at Mar-a-Lago. He makes a speech at uh, the uh, CPAC. He just made a speech at CPAC, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so they preach to the choir. They try to preach to the choir because they're not going to hear anything negative. Uh, when he is uh, when uh, he is talking to people who already believe what he says, of course, that's what preaching to the choir is. Of course, if you go to church, then the reason the people are, are there at the church is because they believe the way that you do, so the preacher can say pretty much whatever he wants. The staunchest people in the church are the people that sing in the choir, so that's why they call it preaching to the choir. For a speaker to influence someone, they must uh, have credibility. Uh, credibility has to do with uh, believability. Uh, they're most, uh, most likely with someone considered to be an expert or trustworthy. They're believable, they're credible, uh, and this is, uh, this is what we need in order to persuade somebody. Uh, when someone delivers a message that we don't consider credible, sometimes we will forget the speaker, but remember the message. So you don't really need a credible speaker sometimes. All you need is a message that it will be repeated over and over and over again. Uh, this is one of the problems we have with uh, what we are referring to as fake news. What is fake news? Well, fake news is, is information that comes out from a source, but we don't know what that source is, but people repeat it over and over and over and over again. Uh, just recently, um, after the Parkland shooting, uh, some of the students from Parkland came out and they started talking about gun control. Uh, and uh, the media got, got a hold of a picture of one of the kids, and they said, he's a crisis actor. He's, he's, a, he's an adult. This isn't a kid at all. This, guy's, this, this is an adult. And it just exploded all over the internet. They decided that this guy was actually an adult. He wasn't a, a, a student from Parkland. And of course, it, eventually it turned out that that was completely erroneous. He was a student from Parkland. He was 17 years old. He wasn't an actor. But they got the idea that he was. And, and by doing that, they attack his credibility. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to attack his credibility. Fascinating stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there. During the election, there, were, there was a lot of information coming in from uh, Russian trolls. They were, they were producing uh, videos. They were producing uh, sound bites that had to do with attacking uh, uh, 
Secretary Clinton and uh, supporting Donald Trump. And, and other people picked it up, and as soon as they picked it up, it, it gained credibility. Nobody knew where it came from. And now we find out that it was on Facebook, it was on, uh, it was on all, all kinds of uh, social media. It was on Google. Uh, so if you type, and actually I can remember this, you know, looking at Facebook during the election, and uh, sometimes over on the side, you know, you're reading your stuff over here, but over here there's stuff about uh, Hillary Clinton. If, uh, if you watch this video, you would never vote for Hillary Clinton. You know, and I, I never did click on it, but uh, you, that was BS. I mean, it was not credible. It was, the source was not credible. When some del someone delivers a message that we don't consider credible, uh, sometimes we'll for okay, and this is known as the sleeper effect. So you remember the message, but you forget who gave it to you. I have lots of friends who are conservative, and they sent me a lot of junk and, uh, during the election. And sometimes I would remember that junk, but I couldn't remember where I heard it. So is, is it true or is it not true? Well, if it came from my friends, I knew it was probably not true. <laughs> Not the brightest box in the, in the in the world. One of them had had a stroke, and this guy kept sending me stuff and sending me stuff, and telling me that he knows better than anybody else. My God, half of his brain is dead. What's the probability of him being that that much smarter than everybody else? Low credibility may be caused by a discounting cue, such as when a prediction of improving economic conditions is given by a government spokesperson, who is presumed to be biased, of course despite the fact that the individual is biased, and this is what they're hoping, this is what the White House is hoping. Uh, they have Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, is their spokesperson, and uh, she says, she repeats the same things that the president says. Well, if, if, if you say it two times, that makes it true. No, you have to say it three times. Okay, so we've got, we've got Huckabee Sanders saying it, we've got President Trump saying it, and then it's being followed up on uh, Fox News. So now it's been said three times. What I tell you three times is true. All I have to do is hear something three times, and it becomes true. It becomes believable. So now we've had Trump say it, we've had uh, Sanders saying it, and we've had Fox News saying it. So if I can't remember where it came from initially, if I don't know where it came from initially, if I just heard it uh, as a soundbite, I don't, didn't, don't remember the president tweeted this you know, three days ago, and the suck of Huckabee, Huckabee Sanders, I don't like it. Suckabee Sanders, that's not right. Huckabee Sanders said it, and then it was on Fox News. That's three times, and I don't remember where I heard it the first time. Now all of a sudden it becomes true. So we have to be really careful about this. Whenever the message eventually gets separated from its source by dissociation, the message may gain more credibility, and of course that's what happens. Uh, this is, uh, has to do with the weapons of mass destruction. I don't know if you remember the war. You, of course, you were too young at, at the time. Uh, but uh, it didn't take us very long to win the war. We, we captured the entire country. Uh, we started looking for weapons of mass destruction. All of a sudden, nobody cared that there weren't any weapons of mass destruction. We were looking for them, but we couldn't find them. Uh, and of course, he came in and said uh, that the war was over and that we had won. He declared victory. <laughs> and of course, then the war went on for like six more years. But we never did find any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, as interesting as that is. People can be afforded expert status either through their perceived knowledge. Uh, doctors, for example, have medical knowledge. MDs have medical knowledge. PhDs in psychology have knowledge about suicide or knowledge about this, anything that deals with psychology. We have expertise. That's what the PhD means. That's what the MD means. Individuals who deliver information in a straightforward manner rather than a hesitant manner are considered more believable. So the faster you can talk, uh, the less hesitantly you can talk, or the more believable that you will be. We're still talking about the communicator here. When people look at their audience, uh, look, look their audience in the eye, they are perceived by the audience as more believable. Uh, at the debates, uh, the person that uh, sweats is the individual that you can't trust. Why is he sweating? He's sweating because he's lying. Uh, the individual that blinks more, the most, is the individual that's less believable. So the one that can keep their eyes open without blinking more is the one, uh, it's not easy, it's really hard. Uh, and we see this on television. I, I've started noticing this on television. Watch commercials and watch how many times they blink. There's a commercial about Depakote. No, it's not Depakote, it's, it's some, some diarrhea medicine. 
Anyway, this lady doesn't blink through the whole thing. She keeps her eyes open for like 30 seconds. Well, does that mean that it's believable that that stuff really does work? Well, yes, kind of, because the more you blink, the more you lie. That's just the way it works. So that's what we're looking for. So in a debate, what we're looking for is how many times somebody blinks. I know, and they, they'll talk about it. It's really kind of fascinating. Trustworthiness is also higher if the audience believes the communicator isn't trying to persuade them. Uh, and of course, during, during a debate, you're, everybody's trying to persuade everybody else. We also perceive as sincere individuals who argue against their own self-interest. Let me give you an example. Uh, when the, the environmentals, environmentalist known as Green Gene spoke at a rally to save California coastline from off offshore oil drilling, she really didn't persuade anyone not already convinced to change their mind. Her name, she's an environmentalist. Her name's Green Gene. Of course she's not going to persuade anybody. Everybody knew who she was, and everybody knew what she would say before she even opened her mouth. However, Harvey uh, Selby, a former vice president of Arco Oil, spoke out against the drilling because of the company's uh, callous, oil company's callous feelings about the environment and drive for profits. He was much more persuasive. Why? Because he was a former vice president of the, of the oil company, and he spoke out against the oil companies, saying that they were greedy and they, that they were uh, callous toward the environment. So he convinced people, but she didn't. Of course she didn't. Everybody know, knew what she was going to say before she opened her mouth. But nobody knew what he was going to say. Other persuasive speaking methods, attribution. Uh, to what do we attribute the speaker's position? Why do they have this position? Uh, as far as Green Jean was concerned, we understood what she was going to say. She's an environmentalist. She, we knew uh, that she was going to speak out uh, against the oil company and in favor of the environment. But as far as Harvey Selby was concerned, he was more likely to persuade people to change their minds because he was going against his own self-interest. However, if you thought that Harvey Selby was only doing this in order to punish the company, then that wouldn't persuade you at all. Okay. Speaking fast. I know, this is really bizarre. The faster you speak, the more trustworthy people think that you are. This is true in the United States, but it's not true in Korea. The faster you speak in Korea, the more likely you think somebody's trying to sell you a bill of goods. Uh, even if your, your speech rate is double what, nor uh, what normal speech is, 140 to 150 words per minute, speakers are still seen as more trustworthy. Fast speech conveys power and competence. Uh, if you've ever had one of those guys try to sell you something on the telephone, it just bugs the hell out of me because they talk so fast, you don't have a chance to think about what they're saying because they talk so fast. Now this is a, actually a trick. Fast speech is a good advertising ploy because it doesn't leave time to counter-argue. And that's why they're talking so fast. Because they don't want you to think about it. They just want you to accept. They want you to keep, start saying yes as, uh, from the very beginning. So they ask you a question that you can't say no to. You, 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 you like uh, a good time, don't you? How can you say no to that? <laughs> so they want you to start saying yes right away, as, as soon as they possibly can. If they can get you to say yes, then they, you are more likely to accept what they have to say. The mo uh, it most often works because it enhances peripheral route per processing. In other words, we, we are processing not the, the reason, we're not thinking about the reason, but we're thinking about the emotions of what they're talking about. I keep getting people calling me from Branson, Missouri, trying to buy, they want me to buy property in Branson, Missouri, or they want me to come out there. They're going to give me a, a three free nights in a, a fabulous casino hotel in Branson, Missouri. I have to pay for the food, I have to pay for the transportation, I have to pay for a lot of things, but I don't have to pay for the hotel. I get that for free, for two days and three nights or something like that. Anyway. You like a good time, don't you? <laughs> uh, other persuasive speaking methods, attractiveness. Really? If somebody's attractive, they can persuade you? Attractive spoke persons are far more persuasive than unattractive spoke persons. Think of some ugly guy that is able to persuade you. Anything. I don't care what it is. Some ugly guy. No, don't. Don't say me. That's, not, <laughs> that's really mean. But let's 
think of somebody on television, some politician, some preacher, some, some spokesperson that's really dog face ugly. Can you think of any ugly people that talk, try to talk you into anything? Preachers, politicians, ugly people. Short, ugly little guys. No? No. They're all tall and... There was, there was a time where I um, was invited to a dinner, a steak dinner, in Sizzlers. And, um, the part of it is that they didn't want to tell you what we are trying to sell to you. You know, to, until the end, it was like right. a piece of property. Sure. And I was looking at him and he's like, um, I don't know, but it was just a property just right a couple of miles. <laughs> um, said, a, thanks for dinner, though. <laughs> well, not only that, but you could win prizes. Didn't they have a lottery at yes. the end? And, and you could win a television set or uh, they didn't, uh, or frozen steaks. They had, they had frozen steaks. It's like three of them. You got three frozen steaks. I don't steaks. know how I got invited. It just, it just, it just said like a free steak dinner, so I went. There you, you know, go, free food. And there was right. people on a big table. Like, oh. So you're sitting around with a, a, a bunch of people, and they're all going, wow, this sounds like a really <laughs> good idea. They're plants. They planted these people, so they're trying to, to implant this idea in your mind. This is a really good idea. These really attractive people all think that I should buy property wherever in Snowflake or something. Close. <laughs> I know. <laughs> attractive preachers are more uh, are always more successful than unattractive preachers, no matter how they deliver their sermons. If you think about it, uh, how many unattractive preachers are successful preachers? If they're on television, who is that guy that uh, just left television? Uh, and and he did, wasn't even a member of a church, but he had this. He was always in this huge auditorium talking about positive things, and then his wife would come out. She's this gorgeous creature. I can't think of what his name is. But he had this plastic smile, you know, making lots and lots of money. It's, it's a racket. It's a good, good deal. Uh, this may be due to the simple fact that physical appeal is tied to acceptance as, at a basic level. So we accept attractive people far more readily than we do unattractive people. Similarly, a similarity is another reason people are more responsive to someone in their own group. So if they look like us, then we are more likely to accept them. Here are some uh, preachers that have been very, very successful. Uh, this is Oral Roberts. He's still on television. That's a 700 Club, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's Jerry Falwell. He's the guy that started Liberty University. Conservative right, the religious right. He's the one that established the religious right. This guy just died a couple days ago. This is Billy Graham. You can see how attractive he was when he was younger. Uh, that's Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> Uh, and this is a lady by the name of Amy Simple McPherson. Uh, she had the largest denomination in the United States. Uh, she was on the radio. Uh, people would come to, uh, she had a uh, uh, church out in California called the Four Square Church. And, uh, she was kind of an amazing person. Uh, she did a lot of this. She was always raising her arms. She was always... She had, she had her speech over here, and she had the Bible in her right hand, and she had her speech over here, she had her sermon over here. She's always raising her arms. Why would she do that? She always wore tight dresses. The style at the time wasn't this. This wasn't the style. The style was loose-fitting clothes. <clears throat> but all of a sudden, she started wearing these tight white outfits with a big cross in the middle of it big plus, big target in the middle of her chest. I know. Why would she do that? Why would she do this? She did it constantly. And she'd be praying and she'd be throwing her arms up in the air and she would be flipping her hands and she'd be, she'd be shaking her Bible. Why would she do that? You know, but you don't want to say. <laughs> It worked. Oh, you know, the guys were just gaga over this lady. Well, she wasn't that attractive. She, she wasn't that pretty. But it worked. It was, it was very successful, bringing in the guys. Bringing in the sheets. Bringing in the sheets. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it made her breasts prominent. 
And uh, of course, this was uh, right after the Victorian era, and of course, nobody was, uh, you know, this wasn't something that people talked about, and it was, uh, you know, it was something that nobody ever dealt with. Anyway, she did that. And you can see how pretty these guys are. These are all very attractive people. The prettier you are, were, the more likely that you were going to be a successful preacher. And an aunt that was an evangelist. She's fairly attractive when she was young. And she did the same junk that uh, Amy Simple McPherson did. McPherson. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of arm waving and whatnot. <clears throat> anyway. And if you asked her or if you told her, what, what the hell are you doing there? You know, what do you think you're doing? She would deny it. No, no, no. God makes me lift my hands up. There's another very attractive preacher once again. <clears throat> so the more attractive they are, the more successful they are. And if we think of politicians, we can think of just about anybody. Uh, they, they're all relatively attractive. And that's what we want to listen to. Who says something is important but of, e uh, of uh, equal importance? Who says something is important but of equal importance is what the person says, right? So it, it, it's not just the individual. They can't persuade us to do anything. They have to say something log logical. logical. Uh, reason versus emotion. Orators for ages have debated which is the most persuasive, reason or emotion. Uh, so if you've heard, you've heard Donald Trump's speeches, was he aiming at reason or was he aiming at emotion? emotion. Really? Lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. That's emotion, not reason. <laughs> Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. <laughs> that's that's the emotion, that reason. Researchers have discovered they, that uh, it really all depends on the audience as to which approach is the most successful. He couldn't have gotten away with that if he were talking to a neutral audience. He could only get away with that if he talked to a large, uh, to a relatively large audience that agreed with everything that he said. Those were the only ones that that uh, that would repeat what he wanted them to say. The better educated the audience, the more likely that reason will carry more weight than emotion. And of course, that's not the pe the uh, people with education weren't the ones that were, that voted for it. If we look at the demographics of who voted for Donald Trump, it wasn't the highly educated people, was it? It was the uh, working class. It was the lower class individuals. Uh, I was primarily white people. <clears throat> it wasn't minorities. Minorities did, really didn't vote for Donald Trump. These audiences are more uh, used to, to arriving at decisions through the central route as compared to the peripheral route. So uh, the, more high, the more highly educated you are, the more, less likely that emotion is going to become part of your mindset. Uh, researchers looking at major elections have discovered that when de decisions about candidates are established by reason, emotional appeals do not work. And of course, he didn't want that at all. And that's one of the reasons why it split the United States so drastically. Uh, the individuals that were in favor of Donald Trump will not communicate with me anymore. They do not. They were communicating with me a great deal before the election. They were communicating with me during the election, but now that he has won, now they're not, they, they're, they're, well, they are supporting him, but they're not, they're not, they can't argue because they're, they can't use reason. It was all emotion before. On the other hand, when decisions about candidates are based on emotion, reason has very little impact on changing an individual's mind about the candidate. And you couldn't argue with these people about this stuff. I have some cartoons from the election. <clears throat> okay, yeah, that has to do with individuals that have uh, extreme right-wing ideas. Most of those guys are gone, by the way. All these people are gone out of his cabinet. They were in his cabinet in the beginning, and now they're gone from his cabinet. I'm sick and tired of, all, of my opponents twisting my words, and then it's everybody says, Hillary's sick and tired. As funny as that is. <laughs> I think she's trying to delete us, investigate Hillary's emails. These are Inspector Generals. Uh, the slogans seem a little weird this time around. What he doesn't know won't hurt you, Trump. Uh, Hillary un unindicted as of today. Uh, Trump, throw caution to the wind. I'm with her-ish. There's no substitute for inexperience. Extremely careless and ready to lead. So those are some of the 
ideas that came, came out of the uh, election. There we go. Hillary's past chasing Hillary. <laughs> Uh, hack please cough. Maybe she'll cough up some of those missing emails. <laughs> I know a lot of a lot of humor there. Okay. <laughs> anyway, and we saw this during the election. Uh, and some people, of course, they were very much in favor of those types of, of cartoons because it's it it, it uh, raised an emotional uh, idea of what was going on. Uh, they didn't have to use reason. Uh, they laughed. I mean, we saw these. We saw these a lot on Facebook and whatnot. I did anyway. I got to see a lot of this stuff on Facebook. And like I said, those people will not communicate with me anymore. As sad as that is, it's time to stop. Why don't we stop right here and we'll pick up with message content on Thursday. Thank you. Oh, let me turn this off. <clears throat>